right, good morning or good afternoon, excuse me, and welcome. We're so glad that you can join us today to have this chat about uh, Diploma Privilege and Diploma Privilege Plus here in the great state of Utah. It is truly my honor today to be joined um, by several distinguished professors and uh, jurists as we discuss this issue. Um, so we're going to uh, have four people talk about the Diploma Privilege and Diploma Privilege Pro Plus in the process that we went through here in Utah. So I'm gonna kick that off by talking about some of the issues that were important to us from an educational institutional perspective and why uh, we reached out to the court in the hopes of having um, Diploma Privilege Plus, as we're terming it, which is um, allowing for licensure after the completion of 360 hours. So we'll talk about, I'll start kick that off. Although Professor Heine will um, briefly have an interlude in my presentation where she presents some of her information and then I'll finish off my piece um, in about 10 minutes. And then we're gonna turn it over to Justice Monis from the Utah Supreme Court. And so we're very pleased to have him here with us. And he's gonna talk about what the um, uh, court considered in looking at these issues. Then we're gonna look at our, we're gonna turn it over to Justice Pierce, who we're also very honored to have with us here today, also a justice of the Utah Supreme Court. And he's gonna talk about some of the comments that the court has received in response um, to both the proposed diploma privilege and then the final order for the diploma privilege. And then last but not certainly not least, we'll turn it over to Professor Louisa Heine, um, who played a really important instrumental role in um, the diploma privilege plus uh, here in in the state of Utah. And so we'll talk about um, options that were considered and uh, kind of the implementation of Diploma Privilege Plus since we got the court's order on April 21st. And after that, that should take us roughly 40 minutes or so. And after that, that should leave us with 20 minutes for questions at the end. I will moderate those questions. Um, so you should see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And so if you type in uh, your questions into that Q&A, I will be able to see them and I can read them off for the panelists so that they can hopefully answer your questions. Um, so with that, I thought I would kick it off just with some background information on why um, both uh, the SJ Quinney College of Law and uh, the J. Reuben Clark uh, College of Law at BYU thought that diploma privilege was really important for us here in Utah in kind of this critical moment of being uh, impacted by COVID-19. So it's important to note that actually before we were hit by COVID-19 several months ago, um, both myself, Professor Heine, and Dean Gordon-Smith, who is the Dean at BYU Law, um, had been invited to speak with the court about ways that we can improve access to justice here in Utah. As hopefully everybody knows um, on this call, we do have an access to justice gap here in Utah. And so we really wanted the opportunity to brainstorm of how um, the two law schools for the state might play a role in helping to close that gap. And actually during that conversation, again, months before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we brought up and we did discuss, we had a brief discussion about the possibility of diploma privilege. The theory being there is that um, it admits more people uh, to the practice of law who have successfully completed law school and demonstrated competency within the law school context. Um, and then also hopefully those people will then go into pro bono and low bono um, legal opportunities. So interestingly enough, this is an issue that we had discussed, um, albeit briefly, but had discussed with the court even before COVID-19 as something that might be of interest to help address this access to justice challenge and problem that we have in Utah. Um, but then as we encountered the COVID-19 crisis and it really became clear to us in March that this was a crisis and this was a pandemic and of course a lot of our students and then also legal employers were suffering, um, we came together with the J. Reuben Clark uh, Law School at BYU uh, to really start to brainstorm and think about asking the court for diploma privilege or some sort of modified diploma privilege. Um, and that was happening in late March, early April. I believe we actually ended up up submitting a memorandum to the court on April 11th. And there are several reasons why um, both myself and Professor Heine and then our colleagues at BYU Law thought that this was really an important moment to look at Diploma Privilege Plus. So first, uh, one of the issues that commonly comes up when we talk about the bar exam is this issue of the bar exam as um, a competency assessment. 
And according to the National Conference of Bar Examiners, the purpose of the bar examination is to determine that those who secure a general license to practice law have demonstrated a minimum competence with respect to knowledge and skills uh, that most newly licensed lawyers should uh, possess. Now, the current version of the bar examination tests test issue spotting, reason analysis, and logical problem solving. Um, but these are the same three skills that are emphasized uh, both at the SJ Quinney College of Law and and at the BYU Law School. Um, so therefore, we believe that our students upon graduation have experience and have certainly been tested in this area through their three years of legal education um, at our two law schools. And while the NCBE, which is the organization which supplies the questions to states, so the states actually administer the bar exam, but the NCBE plays a role in providing um, those test questions. Um, well, NCBE has focused on issue spotting, reason analysis, and law logical problem solving as the basic skills um, that most newly licensed lawyers should possess, many judges, legal academics, and legal practitioners have urged the NCBE to test procedural proficiency, research skills, writing skills, civility, and other attributes of the legal profession. Um, and while Utah law schools, we certainly have extensive experiential learning opportunities, we felt that one advantage of the Diploma uh, Plus program, as it's come to be known, is that not only do you get that background in those areas of issue spotting and reasoned analysis through the three years of law school, but you additionally, through the 360 supervised hours, get experience in these other areas that um, practitioners have determined to be important to our, um, to our profession. There are serious concerns about the accuracy of the UBE, which is the portion of the bar exam um, that is common between some states as a mechanism for determining whether applicants are competent to practice law. Um, the NCBE itself has stressed that the bar exam should be uh, should test issue spotting, reason analysis, and logical problem solving by the application of fundamental legal principles. Um, however, again, there's a disconnect there between what um, practitioners and judges are saying they need and what's actually practiced in the bar exam. And again, we really felt that um, having this Diploma Privilege Plus, again, the 360 supervised hours would help to bridge this gap. The American Bar Association Commission on the Future of Legal Education recently completed a two-year study on issues of legal education and licensure. And in its final report, the commission concludes that one of the major problems in legal licensure is an outdated bar exam that tests too much and too little. Um, so in the subjects it does test, success depends on extensive and granular rule memorization and application. And yet at the same time, it's failing to test these other areas that practitioners and judges have told us that it's important. So there are some concerns with the bar exam and how it's um, being administered. In fact, the executive director at Access Lex Center for Legal Education um, recently explained that there are so many aspects to the bar exam that don't quite align with the practice of law, and one of which is the closed book format. I know in my personal experience when um, I did practice law uh, that I never was asked to answer a legal question of a client without looking at the relevant statutes and the law at hand. And so um, the bar exam has been criticized for that uh, perspective as well. So considering the significant criticism and recognized deficiencies um, with the bar exam, the, um, in, in 2019, the NCBE convened a three-year-long review of the bar exam to actually study whether the exam tests the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we should be testing for entry to the practice of law. So it's really interesting to us that the NCBE has acknowledged itself that we should be reviewing the bar exam and whether it's doing what we need it to do. In fact, Professor Joan Holworth, who was formerly the Dean at Michigan State University College of Law and is currently a professor at UNLV, along with other recognized scholars in the field of bar licensure, um, have criticized the, compact, uh, the content and format of the bar exam, stating that it's an excellent barrier to entry and it's also a superb hazing ritual. Um, but neither of those things are tasks supposed to fill. The practicing bar should be interested in having a licensing requirement that requires a competent lawyer, not one that keeps out the competition. 
So one reason why we were hoping for the Diploma Privilege Plus was because of these concerns about the bar exam itself, that it, caught, it, it uh, tests both too much and too little. There's also this increased access to justice issue. So as we know, access to justice is an issue of significant and increasing concern here in Utah. Um, in fact, in a task force that was created in 2018 to research and make recommendations on this critical issue, stated in its August 2019 report that an estimated five billion people have unmet justice needs glo globally. And this justice gap includes people who cannot obtain justice for everyday problems, people who are excluded from the opportunity the law provides, and people who live in extreme conditions of injustice. An astonishing 86% of civil legal problems reported by low-income Americans received inadequate or no legal help. The task force concludes that bridging the access to justice gap is no easy undertaking. It requires multi-dimensional vision, strong public leadership, and perseverance. It also requires timely action. So because of the global pandemic of COVID-19 and the need for access to justice legal prof to professionals in Utah, um, we knew that we were going to see a surge of this need for legal support because of COVID-19. And that's exactly what we've seen play out in the last couple of months. The need for um, landlord tenant issues, small business issues, the spike in domestic violence concerns. These are all things that we've seen in the last um, several months. And so there definitely are access to justice concerns that are only exacerbated by the COVID-19 uh, situation. And so therefore, perhaps never before has access to justice been so incredibly critical for Utahns. Um, and in fact, uh, that's why we thought it was really important for the Utah Supreme Court to take timely action to address this issue. Another concern that we had with the, um, with the bar exam and giving the bar exam during COVID-19 is that we know that the bar exam disproportionately burdens and disadvantages women, people of color, those with ADA recognized disabilities and low income earners. That has been demonstrated. And with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over because Professor Heine has some very specific um, data and historical information from the SJ Quinney College of Law that really uh, demonstrates that both this is true uh, for our experience and also related to that, that because the bar examination requires substantial resources, both in terms of time and in terms of money spent, that that only exacerbates um, these problems. So Professor Heine? Rookie mistake. In 2016, we did an exhaustive study at the U to learn about what made our graduates successful in the bar. And we learned that about a third of the factors came down to academic strengths, things like your incoming indicators, how you performed in law school, what kind of academic support you got in law school if you were struggling. And about two thirds came down to personal circumstances that I can sum up in two words time and money. Students needed to study 400 to 500 hours over 10 to 12 weeks to be successful on the bar and money bought that uninterrupted study time. Everything from bar preparation programs to time off work to daycare for children so that things were quiet in our study spaces. And as Dean Cronk Warner said, many of our students um, end up at a disadvantage because they lack either time or money, particularly first generation students, diverse students, and interestingly women. Also our students who had any kind of depression or anxiety issues and those who needed accommodations were at a disadvantage. So we knew that to be successful, our graduates needed reliable sources of funding, academic support, moral support, housing, quiet and safe study spaces, internet, almost all bar preparation is now online, childcare, and sometimes tutoring. And when COVID came along, it either impacted or decimated almost every one of those things. So employment became uncertain, money that had been set aside for bar preparation expenses were now needed for living expenses, family members were asking for help, there was no quiet place to go to study, no libraries, 
no places to go to watch live lectures, no moral support, no in-person tutoring. I had students who had no stable internet or no internet at all. Childcare was gone. Um, students were trying to negotiate space and time and internet usage with spouses and roommates and children. And all of this created a huge amount of added stress, particularly for those with health conditions or mental health conditions. And our employers had a lot of concerns as well. They didn't want to hire students who may or may not be able to take the, the bar uh, sometime in the near future. They were concerned about giving and paying for time off if the bar dates were changing. And they were concerned about continuity with clients if graduates were coming in and out studying for the bar. So we wanted to protect the public, to help our graduates, and to help our employers. We also uh, knew that there were some special things about Utah. It's a small jurisdiction. There's only two law schools, both very high quality, high incoming indicators, great bar passage rates. And we look a lot like two states that have been very successful with diploma privilege, Wisconsin and New Hampshire. We also knew that between the two schools in time and money, our students were spending about 59,000 hours studying for the bar. And in terms of financial costs between things like uh, paying for bar preparation, but also the lost opportunity to work, conservatively, just those two schools, we were looking at about a million dollars in resources going out the door. So we looked at lots of alternatives before we wrote a memo to the court. One was just asking that the bar be postponed until September. And the problem with that is that our pandemic crystal ball is in the shop. So we had no idea when or where that exam was gonna be offered. There are lots of logistical problems, even if we have a socially distanced bar exam. As anyone who's planned an event knows, you can't just snap up a venue um, on short notice that has the right size for the right dates. So if we wanted to do a socially distanced exam, the Utah bar would need to have space for about 2,300 people in order to sit 250. That doesn't count all of the problems that go into things like how do you control bathrooms? What about proctors who have to pick up pens and put down pens? What about IT staff who have to be in close proximity to students? Um, what about nursing rooms, clusters of students at lunchtime? And we knew that someone was gonna show up sick, no matter what. And that's gonna put people who are uh, either have underlying health conditions or caring for people who do in a really bad position where they had to choose between safety and a job. We didn't want that. Another option would be to just postpone the exam to some floating date in the future and give third year practice act privileges. You know from studying from the bar yourselves, it's almost impossible to study for a moving target and it leaves students underemployed for a year and then at the end ask them to take a test to prove that they can do what they've been doing for the last year, which is an odd outcome. Um, many alums asked me, why can't we just do an online bar exam? And in March, April, and May, the NCBE said, we're not going to provide one. So that would put us in a very expensive and logistically difficult place of writing, creating rubrics, and scoring our own bar exam with all of the problems that go along with trying to do a secure bar exam online. Um, everyone knows the first time out, that might not go well. Some suggested small group testing sites that had the same health and safety and logistical problems. Another option was a shortened online open book state only bar exam. There are three states that are doing that, but those states already write their own exams. And bar prep companies are not set up to teach state specific law in UBE states. And that brought us to the possibility of either Diploma Privilege or Diploma Privilege Plus. So we put together um, what may have been too long a memo to the justices and to the Utah Supreme Court laying out those options. And I'm going to hand it over to the justices to talk about um, why they made the decision that they did. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. 
uh, to speak. Uh, this is a matter of, of some importance to, to us all. I have to start off by saying that the letter from Dean Cronk-Warner, Dean Smith, Professor Heine, and Professor Bramble uh, was not too long at all. Uh, it is, it was excellently done and brought to our attention in a prompt manner the, the problem with the July bar exam, which I will candidly admit that prior to the letter um, had not hit at least my radar screen. I, I cannot speak for my colleagues. Uh, upon receiving the, the, the letter, the next step involved us gathering information, a series of conversations, a series of lengthy conversations, frankly, at times involving only members of the court, at times involving others. Uh, we debated the issues, debated all of the various options out there. I, I want to be clear about this. I'm speaking only for myself now. I'm not speaking for the other members of the court. But there are three principal reasons why I fully supported the diploma privilege as the best alternative. First, it, it struck me that we needed a we needed a safe, certain, and predictable uh, decision, right? It was and remains unclear and under what circumstances, for example, the bar exam can be safely administered. Uh, two or three days ago, the Utah Bar announced that it intended to move forward with the exam on September 30th and October 1st, if safety permitted. That, that's one heck of a big if. Uh, imagine being a graduating student faced with expending thousands of dollars for a prep course only to find that the test can't be safely administered then um, and is put off for, for another few months. Uh, also, it, it struck me that as a country, as a state, we were facing indecisional fatigue. And by this, I mean kind of that steady stream of, of non-decisions that we were hearing, right? It's, it's, well, we'll know more in a week than, than we'll be able to tell you. And then the week would pass, we'll know more in a week and we'll be able to tell you. Uh, so while in true in many settings that we wanted some more information, at the point in time that we were confronting the issue, it seemed to me that the law schools and the students deserved a firm and timely commitment from the court. Second, um, and Dean Cronk Warner has already referred to, to, to refer to this issue, uh, a strong case can be made that the bar exam um, hurts access to justice, that it's discriminatory, that it has negative impact on a number of, of kind of disadvantaged groups. Uh, one example is the bar exam creates this incredible incentive for students to take the prep course that are offered. They're not cheap, right? So I understand that they, they can cost three, $4,000. Uh, that adds to the financial burden of our graduating lawyers, and it has a tendency to push them away from lower paying public interest to work. Uh, and I'd also ask the folks that are thinking about this and the bar exam uh, that are so concerned about it, why are so many institutions of higher learning moving away from standardized testing? Uh, certainly in part, if, you, if you've been looking at the news, it's because they understand the discriminatory costs this, that are associated with tests like this. Uh, and that brings me to my third point. Uh, uh, perhaps I'm alone on this, I, I don't know. Uh, but to my mind, there's no good evidence that the bar exam works. As a profession, we've imposed enormous cost and hurdle on those that want to enter the profession. Uh, but I don't see, and, and I haven't seen, the validated studies that demonstrate the exam is efficient in screening out those who shouldn't practice law, right? Adopting the diploma privilege to me uh, as a temporary alternative, and let me be clear about that, gave us the opportunity, will allow us the opportunity to do some serious research in this regard. Um, and let me be clear, look, if the research says it is an excellent indicator, it is the most cost-effective indicator, then I'm all for it. I have my serious doubts. So this thinking combined with the criticisms of the various other alternatives led me to wholeheartedly support the Diploma Privilege Plus. Um, the contours of the, of the privilege though we're still, we're still open for discussion. And to that end, we put out the proposal to the bar. Um, the responses were varied, largely thoughtful, very helpful. Uh, and I know Justice Pierce is going to cover the responses, so I'm gonna leave the topic alone with one little exception. And that is this, that based on the responses, both locally and nationally, it seemed to me that, that not a lot of folks had turned into potential legal problems with, with uh, some of the alternatives uh, or some of the contours even of the diploma privilege. And by that, I mean some dormant commerce clause issues, privileges and immunities issues. Uh, and I offer that just as food for thought, that this was not the court's decision uh, 
was subject to intense scrutiny and debate uh, by all of us. Uh, it was over a short period of time, to be sure, over a couple of weeks, uh, but we spent a great amount of time informing ourselves about the alternatives, the issues, and debating them all thoroughly. I, I am convinced that we made the right decision in supporting the Diploma Privilege Plus. John? Thanks very much, and thanks for this opportunity to, to talk about this. As, as Justice Simona said, it was an issue of intense debate, a, a lot of discussion, a lot of viewpoints, um, and so to have the opportunity to, to answer questions and to explain a little bit about our thought process and, and how we arrived where, where we did is uh, very much appreciated. And so I, I'd just like to start by saying, you know, we've received more than 300 written comments when we put out the proposed rule. And I think most justices, I, I know I certainly did, received separate emails and phone calls and texts from people uh, both in the state and outside the state who uh, had strong opinions about this. And so I was really grateful for the, the level of uh, input that came in. Uh, since I've been on the court, this is the issue we've put out for comment on which we have generated the most uh, debate. And it was helpful. And, and I can tell you that you know we received on our website more than 300 uh, comments. Each justice read each of those comments, and uh, we took uh, a lot of them into consideration as we thought about changes to the order. And so I thought what I'd do is just maybe just take a minute and break down the sort of comments we received into a few different categories and, and, and let you know that the tenor of, of, of what we were hearing. Um, the, the first category is we, we just had comments about technical questions or, or proposed changes to the order. And these were extremely helpful in highlighting issues that we either needed to clarify in the order or in the press release explaining the order or actually change the order to address them. So for example, in response to comments, we allowed attorneys who were licensed in other jurisdictions to qualify on, under this rule. Uh, the draft order only applied to, to first time takers. Um, we changed the requirements for who could serve as a supervising attorney. We, um, the, the, the comments helped us understand that we needed to explain uh, some things better, most notably how we landed on 86% as the cutoff. Um, there seemed to be a misconception that we had chosen that number because that was the, the number that would permit both Utah and BYU graduates to qualify. And that's why we had selected it. But actually 86% ties to the first time pass rate on the, the, the Utah bar. Um, you know, if, if we we're tying it to Utah BYU, that 86% number would be, would be higher. And so we needed to explain that. Um, so for me personally, some of the toughest comments we received in, in, in this section were those that asked us to reopen the registration period. Both the draft order and the final order only applied to those who um, had already uh, signed up to take the Utah bar exam and the registration period had closed. We received a, a number of, of really powerful comments from folks whose lives had been turned upside down by the pandemic, who had jobs out of state disappear, um, or because of illnesses or family members were no longer able to leave the state and wanted to take the Utah exam and, and, and were asking if we could reopen the registration period. And, and after much di discussion, we decided that um, we did, it was best to, to limit you know, the, this diploma privilege plus option to those who had already applied to take the exam and had relied on our ability to give the exam for them to start their careers. But that, at least for me, was personally a, a, a very, very hard de decision to make and we received very powerful comments on it. The, the second category of, of comments were those that were, were favorable and not surprising, a number of those came from 3L students uh, who were grateful to, to, to have some certainty in, in, the, in the time of coronavirus. But we also received some from bar members who were appreciative of the approach. Um, these people by and large seem skeptical of the exam as a test for competency, um, believe that, that perhaps it was outdated, that they also seem to be familiar with some of the research that has been referenced earlier, that there's a disparate impact on, on certain groups and that, that this was an opportunity to examine um, whether or not the bar exam is really the tool we need uh, to assess whether people are prepared to practice law in the state of Utah. I received a number of comments in opposition and I, I think a number of those raised concerns about not having a measure of competence, that while we would have this 360 hour requirement, um, at the end of it, nobody was going to evaluate those 360 hours and say, okay, we believe that, that you're qualified to practice law. Um, an interesting theme of some of these comments was the view, and this was expressed in a number of them, we all know people who shouldn't be practicing law. 
we all know that there are attorneys out there who, who, who shouldn't be out there, which to me highlighted the problem that we were dealing with is that uh, there's, a, there's a, a, some mistrust of the bar exam as a precise tool to, to, to tell us who, who's qualified and, and, and who isn't or who has the, those basic competency and, and who doesn't. Um, a surprising number of, of these comments were of the rite of passage variety that Justice Homonis referenced. Uh, you know, basically no more than I had to take the exam and if I had to take it, somebody else should, should have to take it. Um, and then there were a few, I think were quite honest in stating that they saw the bar exam as a barrier to entry that protected their economic interests and that they hated to see that barrier removed. Um, the other opposing comments we received, uh, we received some pushbacks from students who didn't qualify, who went to law schools, uh, who didn't have the 86% the pass rate and, and were concerned about that. And also the deans of the law schools for those students who wouldn't qualify came, you know, went to bat for their students and, and uh, pushed back on, on what we were doing in the order. The, the next category of comments, I, I sort of think of, uh, in, in my head, I started to categorize them as sandwich shop comments, which comes from, uh, I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to practice in front of Judge Jenkins, but I had a case in front of Judge Jenkins uh, once where I represented a, a sandwich shop in a trade dress infringement case. And just in one of those really long Judge Jenkins conferences, he just said as an aside, everybody thinks they can run a sandwich shop, but it's a lot harder than it looks. And I've thought about that again and again and again in a variety of contexts over my career, um, including this, because a lot of these were just sandwich shop comments. And, and, and Louisa discussed a, a number of these. Um, just, well, why don't you offer the exam online? Well, why don't you offer it in a number of smaller rooms? Well, why don't you offer it over a series of days over several weeks to smaller groups? Um, and, and as Louisa mentioned, I mean, a lot of these are answered by the fact that this isn't our exam. We get it from the NCBE and we offer it on the terms that they allow us to offer it. And so a lot of those were just precluded uh, to us. And, and some of the suggestions we received in, in this category um, dealt with, well, why don't you just postpone indefinitely? Why, why do you have to make a decision now? And I, th I think Justice Simonis has, has spoken to this powerfully. Um, there was a real benefit to, to certainty and to, to deciding what we we're going to do and let people make plans around it. Um, and the last category of comments I'd like to approach are uh, those that came from folks out of state. A lot of law professors and, and other people who watch the profession. Um, I think these have been for the most part positive. The criticisms I've seen of the approach that we've taken have, at least the ones I've seen, have mainly focused on the 86% threshold and believe that that's something of an imprecise measure. Uh, and so we, we, we've, we've taken some hits there. But, but by and large, I, I think that um, people have been generally uh, uh, impressed might be too strong, but, but favorably inclined to what, what we're trying to do here. And I think part of it is, um, as we see what other states are doing, um, I, I think our approach, be, at least in its ability to provide certainty, uh, looks uh, pr pretty good. And you know, just some of the, the things that other states are doing, and you may be aware of these, New York is going to offer the exam in September, but it's rationing seats to those who went to a New York law school. It'll open up leftover seats to a broader group after, but there are folks who have signed up who, who aren't going to be able to take the exam, it looks like. Florida is going to go forward in July in two convention centers. They're going to require temperature checks and masks and social distancing. And there's some reason to believe that if the, the governor's order dealing with folks coming in from out of state remains in place, that applicants will have to arrive to the state 14 days early to quarantine before they can, they can enter the exam. Uh, California is going to offer it in September, but it's asked its bar to take all steps to, to offer it online, um, which for the reasons we've discussed, you know, if, it's, if you're going to use something from the NCB, you have to do it when the NCB uh, makes it available. Uh, we've just learned in the last week, the NCB will offer in October an online version of, of the test, but it'll be abbreviated and it won't scale those scores um, and uh, it won't be transferable to, to other states. Nevada is going to forego the UBE and offer its own online exam that can be taken open book and they're gonna draft it themselves and uh, it'll be eight one hour essay questions with a performance section. Uh, Washington is going to offer it in July and October, but they've temporarily lowered the score that will be needed to, to, to pass. So I'm, I'm not being critical of, of any of these approaches. Um, you, you know, the, the, the part of me that appreciates the, <laughs> the principles of federalism likes the, uh, the laboratories of democracy and, and the ability for states to innovate and try to find something that, that, that works for them. 
Um, but, but I think it highlights that that people are grappling with with this situation, and and there's not a one size fits all answer. There, there there's no perfect answer. Um, and I think that's what we've seen from the out of state comments is that people have tended to appreciate. Um, Utah's willingness to provide clear lines and certainty, at least for a, a large number of the people who had applied to take our exam. I think that kicks it back to me to talk about how Diploma Privilege Plus has been working so far. As most of you know, the court set some strict eligibility rules, and those who were eligible had until June 1st, so last Monday, to opt in. Once they opted in, they, um, well, actually even before that, they began accumulating 360 hours of supervised practice. They can have more than one supervising attorney. The attorney needs to have an active license, have practiced for five years, two of which have to have been in Utah. And the court set some parameters on certain types of practice. So for example, if you want to appear in a deposition, you need to follow the Third Year Practice Act and have taken evidence. So there are, are a list of, um, I wouldn't say restrictions, but guidelines on what um, our graduates need to do. We have strongly encouraged our graduates, as has BYU, to participate in Access to Justice. And as part of that, we have put together a series of pro bono programs and the hours that students do in those pro bono hour, uh, programs automatically count towards their 360. Our graduates also must pass character and fitness. If at any time the character and fitness committee rules that they are ineligible, they cannot get a diploma privilege license. They must pass the MPRE if they have not already, and they will still be participating in the new lawyer training program. Supervising attorneys are providing mentoring and communication with other attorneys, but they do not have to be providing the work. Students can get the hours through pro bono, volunteer, paid, unpaid, a variety of patchwork programs and um, opportunities if they wish. And when the student is doing access to justice programs, the supervising attorney doesn't need to do anything additional. Um, so far, we haven't had any problems placing our graduates with supervising attorneys. Everyone has at least one. And so far, we haven't had any concerns from any supervising attorneys that the process has been onerous in any way. And instead, they've been um, very excited in terms of supporting our grads. I think the only complaint that we have heard is that this didn't exist when they were taking the bar. Um, at the end of all of this, our graduates will have a license that looks exactly like every other Utah license. It is not transferable. It looks a lot like the bar looked when we took it. You have a license to practice in that state and you can later apply as an attorney applicant on motion if you've been in practice for a number of years and want to go to another state. So numbers, we had 87 May graduates, 75 of whom were eligible for diploma privilege, 70 of them opted in. We have 13 students who are sitting for the bar somewhere, all but two are sitting out of state. And 11 of our students have said they might want to take a bar exam somewhere in some jurisdiction at some point in the future largely because they see some value in terms of their practice and being licensed in more than one state. We have an alum who has created a website that will help our graduates match with employers who have paid or unpaid projects of any size. It's called Clerk to Counsel. That has been very successful. Um, both the Access to Justice program at the bar and the new lawyer training program have created uh, websites to provide opportunities and information to our diploma privilege graduates. And we've lined up, a, a, I think, really nice variety of pro bono projects through Utah Legal Services, immigration projects, brief advice clinics, et cetera. And we're working with Justice Peterson and the BARS Wellbeing programs to encourage our diploma privilege graduates to use some of their hours to help other people because we know that that helps with attorney well-being. We also know it helps build a connection with pro bono and with the bar itself. We know that by welcoming these students in and encouraging them to help with the bar and help 
um, the, the Utah State Bar and to help others, it's gonna strengthen those long-term commitments. So in short, so far, um, knock on wood, it has gone off almost without a hitch. And I hear regularly, um, I get emails with thank you notes. Students are really grateful for the opportunity. They appreciate both what the court has done, but also the way in which their employers and um, those who've been willing to supervise have really embraced the, pro the process and given them opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. And with that, I'm going to send it back to Dean Cronk Warner for questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for excellent presentations. I really enjoyed that. Um, so now we have uh, about 20 minutes, which is great for questions. So if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you should see a button that says Q&A. And if you type your question in there, then I can ask that of our panelists. And while I give people some time to um, type in their questions, I just want to publicly thank um, the justices and the Utah Supreme Court for their work on this. Um, sometimes it's not easy being at the vanguard, but this is an instance where I'm so incredibly thankful for what you and your colleagues did, um, both on behalf of our students for everything that Professor Le Louisa Heine just said, um, but also I think this really benefits our legal profession as well because it gives employers certainty as to when people will be licensed and not having to allow people to take um, you know, 12 weeks off to study for the bar at some unknown time. Um, I've had comments from um, legal educators from around the country who've just said, we're so incredibly impressed with the Utah Supreme Court being willing to be leaders on this issue. And it, it really highlights how Utah is progressive and is leading the way, not only on this issue, but on many other ways, such as in the access to justice space. And so I just wanted to publicly thank the court for all of the work that you did on this and your willingness to be at the Vanguard. It's, it's very much appreciated. Um, so with that, we can turn over to our questions and answers. So our first question comes from an anonymous attendee uh, who said that my bar prep was eight weeks of intensive review of areas I had taken in law school and intense exposure to several areas of law on which I had taken no classes in law school. While I'm not a fan of the bar exam, it was like another semester of law school. Are there any plans to replace that breadth of exposure and intense review of the fundamentals? The problem with the 360 hours under the diploma privilege is that it will likely be very specific rather than broad and review focused. Dean Cronk Warner, who would you like to have answer that question? Um, well, everybody's unmuted. So did somebody want to take it first? <laughs> Justice Pierce, I know that you've been um, putting some work on kind of not only just the diploma privilege plus uh, order that we received, but also kind of thinking forward um, on the task force and reviewing this and what that might look like in the future. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I'm happy, I'm happy to, to answer the question or at least try to answer the question. Um, but, but I think, Dean, you, you've referenced something important, which is that, um, you know, part of what we're hoping to do um, is, is continue to study these issues. Um, I told, you know, I'm, I'm an adjunct professor at, at, at the U and I'm grateful for that experience, but I told my two L's that they should plan on taking the bar exam uh, in, in 2021, even though we're going to continue to, to look at this and see how effective th th this has been. Um, so with respect to the, the question that um, our anonymous person asked, you know, with respect to, to the students who are going through the process now, no, there, there's no um, plan to, to do anything with those 360 hours to make sure that they're spread out over a, a variety of, of practice areas. We have talked to the bar about the new uh, lawyer training program and whether or not we're going to want to make modifications to that um, to, to, to um, address some of these things and, and uh, whether or not we may want to see what we're requiring as part of that. But to a larger point, you know, going forward, I, I, I think that the, the question goes to some, some fundamental questions about the value of the bar exam. Um, and, you know, I think about my own experience. I took the bar exam in California and practiced there for a few years and then came to Utah and took the bar exam here. Um, at the time, Utah required me to, to know secure transactions and California didn't. And I remember even when I was studying for the exam, so how is it that I could be a licensed attorney in California without you know, being able to answer some questions about, or potentially answer some questions, because there was no guarantee that would be the topic of one of the essays. It was just a possibility that I would have to, to, to be able to, to, to write persuasively on 
secure transactions in Utah, but not in California. And, and so I, I think that is one of the things that this working group will look at. You know, do, do we value requiring people to have that breadth of experience as part of a, a professional licensing exam? I vividly remember after being licensed in Michigan and DC, having to learn tax for the Montana bar exam. That was <laughs> not the most pleasant experience. Justice Himonis or Professor Heine, anything to add to that? Yeah, um, you know, I thought it was interesting because it built into the question is, is this assumption that if, if I have a little more substantive knowledge, this extra semester of, of law school, um, that, that somehow, uh, you know, being tested on that will make me a, a more qualified attorney. Uh, and I would just continue to harken back to the show me the, the validated study that suggests that this kind of test, um, that when you cram for it you know, over a limited period of time, uh, that in fact it correlates in any way, shape or form uh, to competency. Right? I, I mean, I get that it might be fun and it might be interesting and it might be educational kind of short run. Great. Um, but that's not really the purpose of the bar exam, right? So. I would just follow up. Uh, Justice Pierce mentioned a working group. I think this really is a great opportunity for us to study lots of things, including um, whether the bar exam tests and ensures the kind of competency and protects the public in the way that we really must protect the public, um, all the way to how do we use um, some of these resources to close access to justice. The law school at the same time is going to be sort of following in the shadow to make sure that whatever concerns the court has about competency, the law school is directly addressing. Right now, um, if you create a measure, the system turns towards that measure. So our academic support is very bar facing in a lot of ways. And we wanna make sure that we're facing in whichever direction the justices feel we need to be in order to ensure that the folks out on the market really are practicing law in the best way possible. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and just speaking for the College of Law too, um, you know, the states that have uh, diploma privilege already, so Wisconsin, and then in some instances, New Hampshire, those law schools also offer a specific course for the students who are going to per, um, pursue diploma privilege. So if this were something that became an option in the long term, um, certainly the SJ Quinney College of Law would be committed to looking at what we needed to do internally to make sure that our students are graduating with um, the education that they really need to have to be um, at least as competent as, um, as somebody who's taken the bar exam um, is. So that's something that we would commit to doing as well if, if that ended up being a possibility in the future. Um, so we also have a, a question from another anonymous attendee. What's the difference between Diploma Privilege and uh, Diploma Privilege Plus? So I'm happy to start off with that one and then others may want to jump in. So Diploma Privilege is the idea that um, assuming you pass character and fitness and have passed the required ethics examination, the MPRE, that you obtain licensure upon graduation from law school. So that's the system that, um, for example, Wisconsin has. So that's a pure Diploma Privilege, this idea that licensure is connected to graduating from law school. The reason why we've called um, or we've started to call the program that the court uh, uh, ordered is uh, Diploma Privilege Plus is because it's not pure licensure upon graduation with character and fitness. It's this additional requirement of 360 hours of supervised work. So that's where the plus comes in um, because it's not pure diploma privilege. Um, and then next at uh, anonymous attendee says we are planning on diploma privilege on an ongoing basis. Are there any plans to expand expand the diploma privilege retroactively. It was limited to recent graduates, but I can think of several in the past that gave up after a bar exam failure. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to take the first crack at that one. Um, Short answer, no, 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 no plans to expand it retroactively or prospectively. Um, this order was aimed at, at the, the very specific crisis that we're facing right now. And those folks who had signed up to, to take the bar exam in July in Utah, that we found ourselves unable to guarantee that we could offer them the exam that they were relying upon. So I think the working group will, will take up a variety of, of, of questions and, and look about what we should do with this in the future. But as of right now, no, no plans to, to make it retroactive. 
Okay, we have another question that comes in from Luann, who asks, how many students are currently working with a supervising attorney? Professor Heine, that's something that you might have some information on? Yeah, and that actually dovetails with one of the email questions I got about whether or not all of our students will be or have been able to find supervising attorneys. And the answer is all of them. They all had to have a supervising attorney in place by June 1st, and we've been able to accomplish that. Many of them will be looking for additional supervising attorneys. Um, some just needed someone in the interim. So for example, I have um, a student who's going to an out of state clerkship in October and needed somebody local this summer. So if you're interested in being a supervising attorney, we have lots of opportunities for you. At the same time, all of our students have um, what they needed to go forward on June 1st. So uh, we have another uh, question from an anonymous attendee. It seems like from reading the back of the bar journal, as many of the issues have to do the MPRE topics as bar exam topics, our MPR passing score is lower than some. Maybe an easy way to address some of the problems with those that shouldn't be practicing law is to raise the bar on the MPRE. That sounds like a, a Dino question. <laughs> not, not mine, but you know, I, I mean, John, I think it goes to um, all options right around the table and will be considered as evaluate going forward. What's the, what's the best way of ensuring that uh, those that are entering the legal profession are, are competent? Uh, what's, what's the most efficient? I would follow up with that if that's all right. Um, Wisconsin actually has a lower rate of bar complaints than we do. And Wisconsin is a pure diploma privilege state, which I think goes to the question that the um, attendee is asking, where are there really problems? And you're quite right that oftentimes the problems are not with legal knowledge. The problems are with things like, are you communicating with clients? Are you being civil with opposing counsel? So again, this is a great opportunity for us to explore where there may be gaps in competency and how we treat and test those gaps. But Professor Heine, you're exactly right that the Wisconsin, I mean, when we looked at one of the things we specifically looked at was uh, disciplinary uh, proceedings you know, in Wisconsin versus disciplinary proceedings here and saw a, a marked uh, difference. Now, there, I don't know that we can say the systems are apples to apples, but it was still important information, right, um, in determining whether there was, whether we, we, we expected in diploma privileged states um, to see some increase in disciplinary actions. Dean Cronk Warner, I know I have another email question. Yes, I was going to ask you for that. You read that my mind. Has, <laughs> yes, has come in in advance. So here's the question, and I'm going to ask one of the justices to answer it. I think Justice Jimenez, how do you address the potential perception that the 2019 and 2020 classes who did not take the bar examination will be viewed in the legal community as lesser lawyers since they never took the bar examination? I, I don't think, honestly, that, that it's a legitimate concern. I mean, we have... Uh, for example, again, Wisconsin, where none of us really think of our, our colleagues in Wisconsin as lesser lawyers um, for not having taken the exam, and certainly that those with whom I've worked are in, in no way, shape, or form uh, display that. Uh, two incredibly successful large firms coming out of Wisconsin, uh, hiring a lot of Wisconsin lawyers. It doesn't look to me like like they're, uh, that their lawyers across the country are, are a question for their inability to practice or whether they're really competent. Um, I, I think that that's really an individual assessment that maybe some lawyers may have that bias, but nobody's going to ask that question, right? And clients aren't asking the question. And uh, I think if this becomes a thing that, that lasts for a while, it, it, that, that sense uh, quickly goes away. Uh, and last, I'm going to channel my, my, my inner Dean, Gordon Smith, um, who, when confronted with this question uh, by a student, suggested that the answer should be, what, you mean you got to be a lawyer without having 360 hours of supervised participation in probation uh, and just got to take an exam? Wow. <laughs> so, I, I really 
think there's a lot to be said for the model that, that we're offering. Um, and it's just what we've grown used to in our, our because we're accustomed to that, we, we you know, tend to not want to change from it. And if I could just add a couple things to that. I, I tend to agree with, with, with Justice Simonis. Um, I, I don't know that there'll actually be any stigma attached to it, but I, it was a concern that, that I personally had as, as we were going through these discussions about, about this order. And ultimately where I landed was, you know, these professionals can make a decision about their own career. And if they believe that there's going to be a stigma, if they believe that, that they need to have bar exam passage to, to make themselves attractive to firms and to clients, that option remains available to them. And it remains available to them at any time if, if they feel it, it's, it's impacting their practice. Um, but, but like Justice Simonis, I, I, I tend to believe that that's ultimately not, not going to be the case. I would just follow up with one personal anecdote. I took the bar originally in Colorado back before the UBE. So I had a Colorado only license. Um, I practiced, I clerked and practiced for a short time and then came to Utah, um, having spent most of my career teaching. And I'm licensed in Utah now without having ever taken a UBE or ever taken the Utah bar. And my sense is that clients want to know if you can do the work and get them an outcome that works for them. I don't think anyone's ever asked me what year I graduated or where I took the bar or ever I had to take the Utah bar or a UBE. And as time goes by, I think clients are really gonna drive that discussion. I, I, I think about what my, my first law firm billed me out at to, to the first clients I worked for back in 1996 when I first um, started, started practicing and, and had just passed the bar. Um, I'm certain and just that I would have been a much more uh, of much more value to them had I spent my summer uh, actually practicing law under the supervision of an attorney than uh, I was having spent that time fretting and studying about the bar exam. Agreed. Well, I want to be respectful of the time of our panelists because um, I know that they're all quite busy. And so that brings us uh, to the end of our hour. I want to again thank you, uh, big thank you to our panelists for taking this time um, to talk with this important issue. Um, again, we know that you're very busy and that you have other things that you are taking care of at this point in time. Um, but thank you so much for taking this time with us. This is really helpful conversation. And again, uh, just a big thank you to the Utah Supreme Court um, and for the our admission committee and for the Utah Bar Commission um, and to BYU Law who assisted us with this for all the work that went into this. We're incredibly thankful and we're so incredibly proud of Utah and our Utah Supreme Court. So thank you everybody. I hope you stay safe and you're well and uh, we'll see you back here for our next webinar. Thanks. Thanks.